ok i'm not actually sure for a live or not on facebook but we're going to get started good morning everybody it will be ok out of the depths we cry to god how do we seek hope in the wake of loss in the midst of grief how can our souls wait for the Lord like those who wait for the morning? We wait for the Lord, our souls wait for the Lord. Our souls wait for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. Whose power is enduring love. We wait for the Lord. Let us stand as we're able and find hope in God's presence through O Christ the Healer, number 265. seated. Holy one, in peace or in pain, we call to you and you answer. Hear our voices, O God, in the cries of our hearts. Come and bring us your presence. Come and bring us your peace. Amen. At this time, I'd invite our scripture readers forward. Our Old Testament lesson comes this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1, and then verses 17 through 27. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the, the Amalekites, 
David returned two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jeshar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You, mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, anointed with oil, no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not come back empty, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson and luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. Amen. Amen. And our scripture reading is from Psalm 48. <clears throat> Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. <clears throat> His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion is in the far north, the city of the great king. Within its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Then the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there. <clears throat> Pains as of a woman in labor, as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. <clears throat> your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go all around it. Count its towers, consider well its ramparts. Go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God. Our God forever and ever, he will be our guide forever. Holy wisdom. Holy word. <clears throat> A reading from Second Corinthians chapter eight, verses seven to fifteen. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, let your snakes become poor so that by his poverty you might become rich and in this manner i am giving my advice it is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something but even to desire to do something now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by com completing it according to your means for if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, 
but is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. It is written, the one who had much did not have too much and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Mark 5, chapter 21 through 43. This will be a reading from the gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and he begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and they pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather she grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing on you, and how can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and in trembling. And she fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go now in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they had said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they had come to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion. People were weeping, and they were wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and he went in where the little child was. He took her by her hand, and he said to her, Tabitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately this little girl got up and began to walk. She was about 12 years of age. At this time, they were overcome with amazement, and he strictly ordered them that no one should know this, and he told them to give her something now to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thank you very much to all of our scripture readers this morning. You know, today is just a day of all sorts of technical difficulties, apparently. There we go. Um, please join me in a prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As we come to a time period where it seems like the pandemic is ending, lots of people have been talking about getting back to normal. And uh, there are a number of problems with this idea that we're going back to normal. 
Uh, first and foremost among them, the pandemic has revealed to many of us some of these uh, iniquities, inequalities, some issues that we have. How do you feed children that are starving when they can't come to school and get their free or reduced lunch and breakfast? How do you care for people that are in isolation if they don't have libraries to go to and other public services to talk to? There are lots of things that have been revealed by the pandemic that uh, are in need of healing. And uh, if you don't think that there's situational irony or that God has a sense of humor, uh, please note that in a week that we're talking about healing, here I am still recovering from whatever this is. Um, getting better all the time. But today we're talking about healing. And on a surface level, our gospel today is very, very much about two different people that receive healing. And the first is a little girl. She is young. It is her father who comes to beg at Christ's feet and say, please, please, please come heal my child. And that's not that hard to imagine for anyone that's a parent, anyone that's ever had a child that they cared about. It's not that hard to, to think about going to God and saying, hey, something's not right here. Please bring healing right here, right now. That's not a stretch of our imagination, even in our modern world. The problem is the contrast between that part of our gospel and the woman. The woman who has spent 12 years in agony, bleeding, begging physicians, trying everything, so desperate for a cure. And even if she doesn't think that she is worthy to approach Christ and say, I need help and healing, she still knows that Christ is the answer. And that's where we encounter our sort of first theological hurdle in these healings. Why is this woman any less worthy than this child? Why is this woman so afraid to go to Christ and say to his face, hey, I need healing. Can I get some healing too? She knows that the hymn will be enough to just touch Christ will be enough. She knows where her salvation lies, but she doesn't think she has enough worth, enough authority, that she doesn't deserve what Christ has to offer. It's one of those struggles that many people themselves faced. If we say that nobody deserves God's love because nobody's perfect, nobody's without sin, we are all fallen short of the glory of God, then why do any of us get it? It's because nobody's perfect. This woman is very representative of us at times where we don't think that we're worthy of God's love and yet we know that's what we need to reach out for. That even the tiniest bit of God's grace and mercy and abundance is enough to bring us healing. The picture that's on the front of your bulletins today, I, I took both of those pictures um, and I can't tell you if it's in Israel or Palestine, no. Uh, but the building in which that painting sits, it sits in a chapel uh, and the building is dedicated to women in ministry. So many stories that involved women interacting with Christ are depicted throughout the building. But there's something special about this little chapel that's kind of in a sub-basement because it's built into a hill that was just incredible. To be reminded that a single touch is all that it takes to change a life. That we are transformed wherever and whenever we encounter Christ and that Christ often comes to us where we are rather than having to seek him out in the crowd. This woman sought healing. She sought a cure. She sought something that would change her life forever and always for the better. That is something we can hope for, something that is readily available to us as individuals. But it also presents our next theological hurdle. What do you do for the people where there isn't a healing that's gonna come? There isn't a cure. Many people suffer from chronic conditions or have what's called an invisible disability, something that you don't see at a glance, something that you don't know is happening in their lives. You can't look at someone and say, oh, you have anxiety. 
You can't look at someone and say, oh, I can tell that you have rheumatoid arthritis, so it's gonna be painful for you to walk through this grocery store. You can't make those judgment calls at a glance. They're called invisible disabilities for a reason. So what do you, what do you say to someone that comes to God for healing, who is looking for that miracle, who is hoping for that miracle, knowing that maybe there's actually nothing wrong with being different from others, that knowing that whatever this chronic condition is, isn't necessarily going to see a cure in your lifetime. Aldous Huxley, an author, imagined in a brave new world, a world where no one grew old, no one ever got sick, there were no neuroatypical people, there was no Down syndrome or spina bifida or other conditions that would make people be a part of a group that we often call the disabled. There's a struggle there. God doesn't make mistakes. God makes people just as they are meant to be. So is this a punishment? Are those that cannot find healing in Christ lesser than? Do they not have something to offer? And that's where we have to differentiate between healing in Christ and wholeness in Christ. There are times when there is healing offered, where we witness miracles, where there is a prayer, where there are people that pray and cancer disappears, or people are able to, to, to valiantly fight through disease and illness and come out the other side stronger than ever, not only physically and mentally, but in their faith. There are times when there is healing with Christ. And there are times when it is wholeness that we find instead, where we are at peace, where we say, this is not a punishment, this chronic condition is not something that has been given to me because I am stronger or because I was weaker or because I was lesser than. It just is. Nobody is perfect. And God loves us anyway. God does love us, but as a society, as a group, as a community, we sometimes find ourselves in this difficult space where we look at people and make assumptions, where we say, what does this person have to offer? What does this person bring to the table? And I would remind you that in the Methodist Church, we affirm that people are not valuable to us because of what they contribute to society, what their worth is, what they earn what their monetary value is, that is not how we treasure and cherish people. That's not how we do it here. And there's this huge difference between thinking with intention about inclusivity and saying, you know what, we need to make sure that this space is accessible to wheelchairs so that people can join us. And saying, I don't want my child to be in that group with that child because it makes me uncomfortable because they're suffering from something. They have a disease, they have a condition. And it's really hard to hear those words, to think about somebody saying that about a child. And yet it happens, it happens all the time. There are, there are people who look at the world and say, I don't want to see disease or illness. I don't want to see people who are hurting or in pain. I don't want to know that anybody is anything less than perfect. And that lie har harms us all to, to think that anybody is perfect. Nobody is perfect, and God loves us anyway. Looking at our gospel once again. This child, this woman, who could easily have been lumped into the orphans and widows category, who weren't necessarily the most valuable members of that society, they know that they are enough, that Christ is enough, that the gifts that they have to bring may not yet have become fruits or been fruitful, but they are important and they are valuable. Even if the only thing they ever do is exist, they are still God's precious child. They bring something to the table that is of value to all of us. They know that they are enough. And we, we are blessed. We know that our creator has empowered us 
to do great things. We know that our Redeemer has redeemed us so that we do not fall ill to the sins of the world, this sin-sick and weary world. And our counselor and guide in the Holy Spirit directs us on where to go next. We are blessed that we are gifted in this way. We have been given absolutely everything. We have been given absolutely everything. And so when we reach the end of our gospel and Christ shows up at this house and is told this little girl is dead, that he's gotten there too late, that there is absolutely nothing he can do. Christ doesn't listen to what anybody else has to say. Christ knows who he is, what his authority and power is. And yes, there's, there's these political implications for him where if he shows that he is mighty and powerful, it can be complicated for him. The, the religious leaders are already upset with him. But he goes anyway. And he goes and he brings back this little girl and says, no, she's just sleeping. Get up, little girl. Christ is calling to all of us in much the same way. We are not dead. We are yet alive. And as such, Christ still has purpose for us. Christ still has use for us, no matter what our failings are, no matter what society tells us we have to give, no matter what we think of ourselves. God knows us better than we know ourselves, and God knows we are worthy. We don't deserve the love that God has to offer, and so how much more wonderful is it that that is offered to us? <coughs> Almost made it all the way through. How much more wonderful is it that this redeeming love that Christ has to offer us is not limited to us, to our shortcomings, to our failings? One of the theologians that I love a great deal is named Frances Young. And her one and only child, her son Arthur, was born with profound mental and physical disabilities. And she is where, she's one of the first authors I ever read that talked about the, the realities of looking at someone that you know doesn't understand what you're saying and doesn't understand most things in life and is still God's precious creation, still lights up when they see people they recognize, still takes joy in music and worship, who still brings something to the table, even if it's not what you ever expected it to be. She talks about how seeing her son's face shine with joy was one of the first places that she fully understood what it means to be in God's love in community. Um, we are all God's children. We are all in search of that healing, whether it be for something physical that ails us right now or for our sin-sick souls. And the good news I bring to you today is that it is there, that it is available, that it is freely given to all of us, whether or not we know it. Amen. Uh, in response to the sermon today, please stand, please stand and say the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand and sing number 458. Thank you.
this time I'd invite you to share any prayer concerns that you have and would like to add to our prayer list or just lift in service today. Yes, Belva. Somebody did mention during uh, the Becker service this morning, the families of those in the condo in Florida as well that collapsed. So Florida is on our mind today. That's good to hear, Deb. It's always good to get the good news. You know, it's... it's um, Yes. Are birthday people allowed on the list? Hey, we, we can pray for birthday people. We usually just celebrate them sharing announcements. Um, we also will celebrate her 30th birthday on Thursday. Thursday. Yep, yeah, I turned 30 on Thursday. I'm very excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I mean, I have to go to work, but it's not going to be a bad day. Yep, yep, yep. Um, okay. Hearing, hearing no others and knowing that God hears all prayers, whether or not we voice them aloud. For God alone, our souls wait in silence. For our souls are restless until they find their rest in God. Into this holy presence known only in silence, let us come before the Lord, our rock and our salvation. Let us find shelter in the Lord, our refuge and our strength. Let us pray. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. Hear us, Lord. For this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, hear us, Lord. For the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, Hear us, Lord. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. Hear us, Lord. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. Hear us, Lord. For our presiding bishop, Mike McKee, and all bishops and other ministers for all who serve God in God's church and in the world. Hear us, Lord. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For Kendall, Marty, Sharon, Jackie, Anne, Sylvanus, Danny, Reese, Cody, Micaiah, Donna, Betty, Ashley, Bill, Jimmy, Gloria, Molly, Kathy, Joyce, Donna, Estelle, Paisley, Charlotte, Sheila, Mike, Diana, Greg, Forlisa, Sandra, Tommy, Laura, Cindy, Hilda, Steve, Mary, Don, Jennifer, Nicholas, Wayne, Sharon, Barbara, John, Jimmy, and me. Hear us, Lord. Your mercy is indeed great, Lord. God of grace, we come to you in search of healing. We come to you in search of peace. We come often bearing only a tiny seed of hope within, praying that it is enough. Our cries come in the deepest part of the night, and we do not always ask for help. Our hearts bleed just as surely as our bodies, and we do not always recognize the hidden pain 
of others or even our own. Sometimes we struggle to find our faith at all and forget that doubt too is a part of belief. Give us courage enough to speak the truth of our own struggles and to see and hear and know the struggles of others. Forgive us when we think you only want us if we're perfect. Fill us with your endless supply of love so that we might try again. In your holy name, let us pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Evil. Oh, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Please stand and let us give thanks to God for all the blessings we have been given with the doxology. Every gift we have to offer to God is an excellent gift to give back. God has given us the greatest gift there ever was or ever will be. So whether you are putting a gift in our offering plate today with your finances and your tithes, or you are giving of your time or your talents, or if you are giving of your spirit and your mind, we are grateful for all of these gifts and wish to bless them. Please join me in doing so. Gracious one, you have given us a love that stretches farther than we can see or even believe. You have given us a grace and a forgiveness that is deeper than our vulnerabilities. You have given us a healing and a hope that makes us whole. Take now the offerings of our lives and our hearts, even as we give away all you have given us. Amen. Announcements. Uh, Vacation Bible School was this week. Uh, it is my understanding that we had good turnout on volunteers and 57 children that came and had a good time and um, at least six salvations uh, this week. So that is, uh, those are good numbers. Um, whether it is one or 99, we always want to rejoice when we know that someone has given their heart to the Lord. Um, as my mom said earlier, it is my birthday this week. Uh, are there other announcements? Are there other birthdays? Are there other anniversaries? I know Chuck and Trisha Riley celebrated this week, but theirs was last week. Council is in two weeks. Um, be prepared. Yes, yes, I suppose, I suppose y'all should say to me. Um, <laughs> much more melodious than um, <clears throat> a particular mission trip where it was sung at breakfast to me. Um, it, it, it's fun having a summer birthday, y'all. Uh, okay, uh, our last song today is Win the Poor Ones. It's number 434. We are going to sing it in English, not the Spanish. Um, puedo, puedo cantarlo en español si quiere. Um, well, I'm not doing so well on the singing part today, but I, I can do the words in Spanish. Um, and we are only going to do verses 1 and 2. Uh, so please join me in singing with joyful noise, Win the Poor Ones. <laughs> Oh, that 
for the Lord and God has not failed us we have reached for Christ and he has met us where we are go in peace to love and serve healed whole and free God be with you Amen.